Welcome to licensing, understand why and when to license your ideas. So Chris Katapas is going to be your moderator. And so Chris. Thank you, Dennis. Well, welcome back, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live audience. I am Chris Katopas. I'm the Deputy Chief Communications Officer here at the USPTO. I am truly thrilled and honored to moderate this panel and be involved with this event. Uh, what I see, and I want to thank uh, Nathania, Dennis, Sean, and their team for putting together a great event. Are you guys getting a lot out of this? Should we give them a round of applause? I'll do it over here. So what I see out of the audience are the hardcore. You guys are the people that came back after a day and a half and you're ready for more. And we have uh, a great panel that's really going to discuss uh, what, when the rubber hits the road, how to license your ideas. Now I know some of you may be a little sluggish, you know, from after lunch. Yesterday, my erstwhile colleague, uh, Ms. Dougherty, had us do a stretch. I don't know, do you guys remember that? Yeah. If I lead you in a stretch, I will break something and fall off stage and everything will go off track. So I'm gonna do this and as a compromise. How many of you have your cell phone with you? Pick up your cell phone like this. The USPTO is very proud of all the educational initiatives, all the communication programs that we offer. I want you to go at some point today to our website Sign up for our Twitter, our Facebook, our, our monthly newsletter so you can stay in touch uh, about all of the educational programs we have here in D.C., at our regional offices, webinars and other programs that will teach you about how to patent your idea, how to register your trademark, and so much more. Now, uh, as Dennis noted, this is an educational program. Uh, class is going back into session. I'm very pleased we have Professor Steve returning. We also have... Thank you. <laughs> we also have on our faculty this afternoon, uh, Professor Van Dyke. Uh, Ray Van Dyke, uh, who's a longtime friend of mine, is also the founder of a very prestigious IP law firm, the Van Dyke Law Firm, and he's the, very important, the DC chapter president of the Licensing Executive Society, very uh, a prestigious organization, Licensing is the first word in their title. Guess what they do? So we have a great event and um, panel, and I'm going to turn it over to Steve for some more remarks. And uh, let's classes in session. Thank you. Every inventor in this room has a big problem. You all have a critical decision to make right now and it's going to affect everything that you do in connection with the launch of your product. You're all faced with that same critical decision. You see, you've come up with your great invention. You have a cool new toy, or a great home goods product, or a new app, just a better mousetrap. And now what? Do you embark down that long, dangerous road of self-production? Inventory, sourcing, and fulfillment? Or is there an alternative pathway? You see, self-production seems the most obvious choice. You jump in with the greatest of intentions, and I've seen inventors spend tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. They create molds and samples, elaborate trade show booths, money on a designers and attorneys for your patents and trademarks tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars with nothing to show for it at the end but a garage full of inventory. Inventory which you probably paid more than you should have and sometimes inventory which isn't even saleable for a number of reasons unknown to the novice inventor but readily apparent to industry professionals. So my goal today is to tell you to wait Slow down just a minute, because there's two roads diverged in this golden wood, and one is a much safer pathway, an alternative route to align yourself with industry professionals, companies that have all the sourcing and logistics already in place, the administrative services, and most importantly, 
the relationships with all of the buyers at all of the major retailers. And let me let you in on a little secret. It's precisely these relationships, these buyers, that can make or break the launch of your product, not necessarily the end consumer. So what is this secret pathway, this game plan that will increase your likelihood of success and protect against your downside risk? It's called licensing. Licensing is an established business model that allows you to align yourself with established companies and let them manage and finance the business affairs and allow you to do what you do best, inventing. Licensing is a business structure where you, as an inventor, grant rights to that invention to another company in return for which you'll receive a payment called a royalty for the life of the contract. Now, licensing isn't always a guarantee. There are lots of finer details to negotiate in that agreement. The royalty rates, the percentage, the net sales definition, how long the agreement lasts, exclusivity, performance thresholds. But these are all subject to negotiation. My point is to tell you, inventors, you have an alternative. You need to know there's an alternative pathway that will allow you to align yourselves with these companies that already have all the relationships, let them manage the business affairs, increase your likelihood of success, and protect your downside. You need to be sure you're aligning with the right partners that share your vision for the products and channels of distribution. You want to make sure that they're committed, both personally and financially, committed to this venture. And naturally, since you're adding a partner, you're going to give up some control and give up some of the uh, upside. But to me, those small concessions are more than worthwhile to allow yourself to enter into the market faster and more effectively with your new partner to guide you along your path. So this becomes a critical decision point for you and every other inventor. And as you look at that fork in the road, and look at the two paths, one, a winding road of uncertain terrain, and the other, potentially smoother pathway with a chaperone to guide you on your way, and that choice, as Robert, as Robert Frost says, and that choice can make all the difference. Thank you. Okay, Steve is a hard act to follow. <laughs> but uh, again, I'm Ray Van Dyke. I'm, um, uh, I am a professor. My mother called me professor since I was a child. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I teach uh, engineers, uh, also other attorneys as well, uh, about the, the basics of intellectual property law. And um, I'm involved in a variety of legal organizations in the area. I'm a fellow at the American Intellectual Property Law Association. And... Um, uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm the Greater Washington, D.C. Chapter Chair uh, for the LES. For those in the area, uh, we're just going to post a new meeting on October the 2nd, early in the morning, uh, uh, up, in, uh, up on Route 270 up in Maryland. So contact me if you want to want to go to that. Okay. Um, I am uh, an intellectual property attorney, primarily, primarily patent, although I do trademarks as well, and I do... Uh, assist on occasion with licensing and things like that. Uh, uh, but this is uh, something you need to be aware of. As um, Steve was mentioning, there's a wealth of possibilities out there. But you need to position yourself in advance of that to take advantage of these things. For example, with the intellectual property rights. Uh, they've been talked about at length, so I'm not going to get into elaborate detail on them, of course. You know, patents, a very strong intellectual property right. You know, trademarks for the branding and things like that, that's, that has its uses as well. There's copyrights for the expressions of ideas. Uh, there's uh, uh, trade secrets for those things that you can't patent, but are know-how and special things that are, are exclusive and secret for you. Um, so anyway, these are the types of uh, intellectual property rights that you need to be aware of and how they fit into the plan. Now, with patent, uh, Inventors come in a variety of flavors, mostly two. One, uh, I think as Steve was mentioning, they want to 
license it, just, just to have somebody else do all of those details. And that is fine. The other is to, those who want to roll up their hands, and get out there, and get market share. Okay? Uh, so there's, in, at the beginning of the intellectual property, uh, for, it's the same for both parties. You need to obtain your patent rights. You need to be sure that you are um, uh, equipped to protect the invention. Because otherwise, why would anybody buy something from you if you have nothing to offer? All right? So with patent rights, you need to be sure that you have timely filed it. All right? It doesn't do you any good to have been out there publicizing it and talking about it and writing about it. And then, um, then you file for your patent. That's, that's of course, a big no-no. Uh, it's possible in the US that you may be able to secure some rights if it's within a certain time limit. Uh, but I wouldn't count on that at all with the change in the law to the first to file system. And the rest of the world, since we live in a global world, their patent uh, rules are more strict than ours. So if you talk about it on, on, a, on a Tuesday and try to file a patent for it in Europe on a Wednesday, too late. So anyway, just be aware of that. And there's a lot of other subtleties to this with patenting to keep the, uh, the asset alive. For example, if your patent is going to issue, be sure that you file a child or continuation or divisional or whatever from that. Why, why should I do that? Well, because the person who's going to buy this from you wants a live asset. If you give them just, oh, I got this patent three years ago and, and it, it, it's a great patent. Well, the company may think it's a great patent, but they'd like to, to have their own patent. They'd like to go in there and craft their own claims to go after other competition, more recent comp uh, competition. So be sure that you have a live patent asset uh, uh, for uh, to, you know, your patent portfolio, as it were, for sale. Um, lesser extent with trademarks and things like that, although you may establish a brand that may be portable in a sale. Um, there's a variety of things we're going to talk about in the questions, but um, uh, the main thing are these dates. You need to be very aware of the dates because the patent office is, is very forgiving on some things, but they are not forgiving on other things. So you need to be very aware uh, that these dates have consequences. And if you miss one, that could, you know, you could blow the whole thing. So anyway, let me stop there. Uh, uh, we will address more of these, these subtleties in, uh, in the question, in the Q&A period. Thank you very much, Ray. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a, a hopefully lightly moderated uh, Q&A, and then we're going to go to you, because I know you guys all have a lot of super interesting questions. I'm going to turn to Professor Steve and ask, uh, could you just break down licensing a little bit more for us? Let me, let me walk through the, the hypothetical, what I've heard a lot over the last two days. I've worked super hard. I, I've, I finally got my patent through the USPTO. I have this great document signed by Director Yonku. There's a gold seal on it. Can I just bring it to a company and then get a check for 20 years? I mean, how, do, how does it work? <laughs> if it were that simple. <laughs> um, in effect, though, yes, that's what the goal is. So licensing, very, really simple. It's a transaction where you take the rights under that patent. That patent grants you the exclusive rights to make, use, or sell the products based on your invention. But because it's intellectual property, you own the property rights. And just like you could sell or buy or sell or lease real property, you can do the same with intellectual property. So a license is essentially like a lease of, of real property. A license, you grant the rights in that intellectual property, your invention, to another company, they'll make and sell the product, and what do you want in return? You want the rent or you want the royalty. So that contract, it's a written agreement usually, uh, is a license agreement where you're granting rights to a company to make and sell the products based on that invention. So I met a, a nice young lady, I think her name was Lori, had a great invention. She doesn't want to make and sell that product. She wants a company bigger than hers to take that invention to Walmart or she mentioned Bed Bath & Beyond. 
So we know companies that make and sell similar products. They have the production sources overseas. They have the relationship with Walmart and Bed Bath & Beyond. They will pay her a percentage of every dollar that they make for the right to sell that invention. The hard part, making sure you find the right company that, that's willing to do that and you make the right deal. Let me just ask you a quick follow-up. Yesterday we heard a great panel, how we uh, moderated the panel. We heard about an inventor, he had an idea, he went on a show, and they paid him $3 million and, and they went their separate ways. Is it ever possible to sell your patent to a company? Sure, and the same, same analogy, I said with real property you could lease it or you could sell it. Um, and uh, I think you're referring to the Moki doorstep. So it, it really interesting, he actually had sold his patent, but then Damon John and, and his group together licensed that patent to another company that's actually paying Damon's group now the, the royalty. Um, and hopefully he's still participating in that. But. And, and I think uh, Ray wants to win. Yeah, I'll just uh, uh, add on that. Remember with licensing and everything, you could have an exclusive license or a non-exclusive license. All right. Most of the time, you're going to be dealing with people with exclusive license. They want the whole thing. They want the complete rights to it. That should come at a premium. All right, because you're giving up everything, so to speak. A non-exclusive license means you can license to several competitors. All right, they may not like it, but I mean, you could—you're the owner, so you can make that decision. So this is really a rubber. I want this to be a rubber hits the road kind of hands-on panel, and I'm—I I'm, don't want to go too far into the weeds. Let me ask Ray this quick question so just we get it out of the way. Patents are federal. You got a patent, you can use it anywhere in the states, territories. Licensing is contract law. It's state law, very state by state. Is there a better state? Like if I'm from one state, should I move to like get a better <laughs> licensing deal? Or like how does that work? Uh, I think generally for, for these, uh, you might be able to uh, uh, note this as well. Uh, most states are, are roughly the same. I don't, I don't see any particular state as bad for a like, It's a contract. Now, it, it, certain types of terms that might be more contentious in, in other states, like California has, they're different. And uh, <laughs> uh, like, you know, they, they may have a, a different interpretation on certain uh, terms and all that. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to, uh, if you have an employee, for example, it's a little bit different than what we're talking about. If you have an employee, a uh, key employee that leaves and wants to start up a, a competing a business, you know, you could have a non-compete clause, all right? The non-competes in California are, are a little, little loose. You know, that person can go out and, and, and start uh, the competition uh, a little easier than they would in other states. That's uh, very helpful. I'm, I'm gonna ask a question, and I know your answer to this, but just to have the conversation. Do I need to get an attorney when I'm entering a licensing negotiation? Can I just do it myself? I'm a smart engineer and, you know, work out of my garage. Like, do I need an attorney for, for licensing? Licensing is at the essence of law. And, um, uh, All right, thank you, Professor. Yep. Commercial. <laughs> Steve, Steve, what's your answer? So, I mean, uh, yes. I <laughs> need, is there a legal requirement? No. no. Is it in your best interest? Absolutely. All right, Steve, I want to follow up with you on breaking this down. You know, there's a saying in Washington, a billion here, a billion there. Soon you're talking about real money. I have a great idea. I want to license it. I'd like a, you know, a million dollars. Like, like it, in terms of the terms, like, if I get 5%, like, is that a good deal? I mean, like, what, what, manager expectations, like, what will, what will somebody get? So, the percentages are, are really hard. There are so many factors. The, the first key factor, as Ray mentioned, is it an exclusive or a non-exclusive? If they want exclusive, there, there comes at a little premium. The type of product, is this a consumable, you know, consumer product that's very price competitive? Things like coffee, you know, the margins are so slim, but people are constantly buying more and more and more because it's, you know, a, a consumable. It disappears. Or is this a, you know, one-time single purchase? Is this product sold at mass, like at Walmart and Target, where they're doing huge volumes? Or are these things sold at higher-end department stores and, and jewelry channels where the margins may be may be greater. Um, someone always asks, well, what's an average royalty? I can tell you, may, may or may not be helpful, I've seen licensing deals as low as 2% of wholesale sales, 
I've seen licensing deals as high as 20% of wholesale sales. Where you fall in between that, that all depends on those factors. You want to make a million dollars, licensing to me is a very fair um, structure because you're not selling your product too early. What if you sold, you know, the, the, the guy who sold his, his invention to Damon John, that product goes on to make 500 million or 5 billion, he's gonna be mad that he sold for 3 million. That guy's still making money 20 years later, uh, you know, um, off of my product. On the other hand, if it doesn't go anywhere, maybe somebody overpaid if they paid 3 million or 30 million. So um, licensing gives you a percentage participation, but there's no cap. On the other hand, there's no, there's no bottom, so. There's a saying, so things go up, things go down. There's a very famous saying on Wall Street. They asked a billionaire how, how you got so rich, and he said, you know, I basically sold too early. You know, I sold before <laughs> things went down. So when people in the licensing world say, you know, if you're offered a deal, take it. Is that good advice? I mean, are there good deals and bad deals? Or when you're starting out, it's like, to me, it's a little bit like being an independent, uh, musician or filmmaker, like, like you, you got to like do your first deal before you get like your street cred. Either you, right? you, you're, yeah, you're, I, I, that's that's a tough thing. You may not have any money. Uh, you may desperately need this. I mean, this is all uh, the, the human condition, as it were. And uh, you may get into a bad situation where you've sold a great invention and then the other person's making a lot of money. Just look at Shark Tank. Uh, what, what happens there? I mean, uh, but. Um, yeah, regarding the, the uh, royalty rates and everything, LES, the Licensing Executive Society, uh, we have a, a sections in there where they break it down as to in different, different sectors of, uh, of, say, of uh, the, the economy, what is a generalized uh, uh, royalty rate in that area. It used to be years ago that, you know, 20, 20 25%. It was just, it was floating around. Everybody was floating, doing that. But it's gotten incredibly more uh, competitive uh, since then. So anyway, if, if anybody wants that, just look on the Licensing Executive Society uh, website, and, and they, they, should, they will have that in there. To go back to, to, go back to that question, you asked, is it, is it too early you know, to do a deal? And again, these are always subject to negotiation. Yeah. Very often, um, I'm hired by companies, my company's the brand liaison. We're hired to go out and find uh, the company to license an invention to. We're, we're basically a matchmaker, and we go out and we find that. But sometimes I'm hired as an attorney or just as a hired gun to negotiate and close the deal. So I was recently brought in by somebody. They already had preliminary discussions between the brand owner, the inventor, and this potential company that wants to license her, her brand and her product. And they had already talked about some numbers and things, and my job to try to push that envelope a little, but I was very conscious not to blow that deal. That's an excellent company that they've all, she was already speaking with, and I have to make sure, even though I'm gonna be a tough negotiator, I can't blow that deal for her because this is a great opportunity. So I'm very sensitive to, hey, they've already been preliminary discussion, she's with the right partner, they see the same long-term vision she sees, so there are other things here, besides, um, this is th that person's first license, by the way. There's, there's other considerations here besides the, the royalty numbers on this. I say very often, licensing begets licensing. Your first deal leads to another deal leads to another deal. So I want to just tell a quick personal story. So before I worked at PTO, I was a patent attorney. I was an inventor. I know a lot of people in corporate America. I had this great invention, which I thought you know would set the world on fire. I called a friend of mine at a big company, big tech company, and I said, I have this, I want to talk to you, let's have a beer. I met with him, I said, here's the idea, I have this patent. He looked at me and he said, Chris, you're a really good friend, never ever call me again. Uh, corporations really are very cool to uh, outside ideas. That, that was my experience. Is that your experience? Are there things, uh, it seems to me if you want to approach a company, you need to go to a guy like Warren or, or some of the people that are speaking at this event. But is that your experience that companies don't want to hear from the public or is there a good way to approach a, corp a corporation? You know, they always want a great invention. They are extremely shy about public unsolicited kind of solicitations because 
they, you, you don't know and they don't know that their think tanks aren't already developing something similar. And then they open themselves up to legal exposure. Same thing with the Hollywood studios. If you're writing a script, you can't just send yeah. it to them because they may be working on a similar script. If you have a patent, you're in a little bit stronger position. Um, but this is all about relationships. And, and Warren's a great resource. His, his, um, his, his nonprofit, uh, I think it's the United Inventors, is a great resource. But these companies all are looking for competitive advantage. So if you can offer them a better product than the ones that they and their competitors are, are currently selling, or if you have something that's a potential disruptor in the industry, they, they need inventors bringing them these kinds of things. But it's about relationships. They're not looking yeah. for public to... Yeah, I, it is entirely about relationships with, with, that, with this issue. Uh, historically, uh, big corporations used to like to receive submissions from uh, independent inventors. Uh, but then what happened? You know, litigation started in the 70s and 80s, and then it got worse in the 90s, and then the corporations just stopped. So now because of liability issues uh, and, and exposure to damages, uh, they, they pretty much stopped taking unsolicited, um, um, whether manuscripts for plays and things like that, or, or submissions about, regarding inventions. This is just the reality uh, of the situation. It's unfair, uh, but you've got to know somebody in, inside. And it's very difficult to find the exact person. You would think you would find a per, you know, they, this person has a per, per, proper, proper title and they have authority, and they'll just, they don't want to have anything to do with it. And so it's finding that particular person is the tricky part. So it's going to involve a little um, uh, investigation of your own. We, to find we, out who that person is. We did a license deal recently. We had pitched the licensing person at that organization three or four times, got turned down every time. <laughs> in a different meeting on a different property, we mentioned it again in the room when the president was there. And the president said, wait, wait, I want that. <laughs> and and the, we did the deal. So we didn't throw the licensing person on the bus. But she turned us down three or four times, but we got to a different person at the same company, unrelated. So. Um, Admirable persistence uh, is, is important as well. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions because I see people, you know, sort of in, intrigued. But I just want to ask um, Ray one question. You talked about uh, various forms of intellectual property. We've talked about that, you know, don't wait too late. You know, you, is it appropriate if you have a lot of people are told get a, a provisional patent? or um, they may have a patent pending, but it hasn't been granted yet. Is that situation ripe enough to go pursue a licensing deal, or is that too early? OK, well, that, yes and no. Um, Thanks, Professor. I will. <laughs> uh, provisional patent system is something that the Patent Office started many years ago. And it provides all of you a relatively inexpensive means to protect your idea. All right, to buy you at least a year before you have to formalize and, you know, and get things down in, in, the, in, the, in the strict format that the patent office requires. You can be informal. All right, uh, that year you know, progresses pretty quickly. All right, so um, then you get into the, the patent is pending. Now, at this stage, you have no rights. All right? it's, it's a prospective right. You have no patent. You have a patent application. You have no patent. So you approach somebody about the sale of this. What do you have? Right? You have a prospective right. Now, if, as you mentioned, you, know, you have a blockbuster idea, and it, it, it is definitely going to be a game changer, that might be a different situation. But for 95% plus of, of inventions, that is not the case. It, uh, most inventions are going to be more an iteration or a slight advancement over what's out there, and companies are not going to be very interested if you don't have a right in place. So um, that being said, if you have the patent or patents, at that point you have exclusionary rights. You have rights that are conferred by the government in your title in that patent. There you have something to bargain with. Then it gets into, does the patent have any meat? Are the claims good enough in that patent, or are they weak? 
Did you compromise yourself in getting that back? There's a host of these subtle little issues that creep into there. Right? So I would advise, you know, again, the attorney, you know, sometime, at some point in here, you know, even with the provisional, I, I strongly would recommend at least an attorney look at it before you file it. I, I, because you can, even in the provisional, there are little subtleties, I was mentioning this to one of you earlier, that could affect you in a foreign country 10 years from now if you don't do something in that provisional. Anyway. So as far as the licensability of it, um, if you have a provisional filed, um, especially if you also have a patentability opinion letter, you can feel relatively confident going to mm -hmm. some of the bigger companies. You have your provisional, so you're protected. Patent opinion letter gives them a level of confidence it's going to be granted. But as Ray said, the key is going to be the claims that are granted. So even if you're still pending, but you've gone one or two rounds of office actions that you know at least some of the claims that are very likely to be granted, that also puts you in a strong position, even if it's not finalized. So when people come to me and they say, well, I'm patent pending, well, what stage are you at? Well, we just filed last week. There's a little window where it's really tough. Without a patentability opinion letter and you just filed, mm -hmm. we don't know yet how strong that patent is going to be, especially when there's no patentability opinion letter. If you've already gotten an office action or two and you know these 10 claims are accepted, these 10 were still trying to get all or some of them, but now at least we know, okay, Here's, this is what we have that we're, we're pretty confident on, and, and I can license at, at that point, we can be creating licensing deals. So early or late, there's a little window in the middle uh, where it's harder without that patent ab patentability opinion letter. Let's open it up to questions, and if you would, maybe uh, tell us your name and maybe what city you're from. You don't have to, but it'd be nice to get to know you a little bit. Any questions? This one here. Christine Kenefick, Reston, Virginia. Uh, suppose you have an invention, maybe uh, has a provisional patent application, maybe issued patents, and you decide it's best or even necessary to go outside what's called company-controlled facilities to do additional testing, maybe prototype building, um, small-scale manufacturing. Um, can you comment? Uh, whether it's no. better in that situation to use a non-disclosure agreement or an actual licensing agreement with that new party coming in. Well, oh. you, ha okay. you have your patent right. already in that question? No, she has a provisional patent uh, application. You can answer it both ways, issued yeah. patent I'll and you have, Okay, so you, you're in the development of the product, you have a provisional application on file, and you're still doing further research on it, in essence. Okay. Uh, yes, it would help to have a non-disclosure agreement uh, in place with that because, again, you want to protect your invention. Now, what, you, know, you can rely on patent pending. You can tell people, oh, my patent's pending. And that'll get you so far. But, I mean, I, I would treat even the patent filing as a trade secret for yourself because there's no point you telling people that you have a patent unless it's going to do you some good. So keep that particular information to yourself. And do not tell them how far along your patent is. Because you could say patent pending, you have a provisional patent on file. It's going to be years, perhaps, you get the patent. They, you say patent pending, it may be, it might, it might issue next week. So they're saying there, there's ways of using that particular phrase. In your situation, uh, I would be concerned about perhaps augmenting the, pro, the provisional by filing a second provisional, building on that one, with the new information that you have on that. And at the end of the one year from the provisional filing, when you must formalize and file the utility application, you combine both provisionals into the one utility. Okay? And guys, I know we're throwing around a lot of terms about uh, the patent procedure. I just want to remind everyone in your packets, there are some uh, references to the USPTO resources, our, our pro se help, our, our, the pro bono law clinics around the country. We don't want you to feel you know, intimidated by, by some of the, the language that's being used. The process uh, can be a little daunting. Any more questions? Uh, so the, I think in the back. Hi, my name is Kim and I'm from Richmond um, here in Virginia. Um, have a concept. Um, Easiest, it's a service, but it's going to have a tech um, aspect to a major tech aspect. The easiest way to compare it is like Uber and Lyft. Um, 
We will submit a patent. We're getting ready to enter the testing phase, but we do have a lot of interest for this idea in different markets. So we're going to enter the testing phase for about 90 days starting in January. And then we can go ahead and proceed with the patent application. Um, with the, I was, as far as growing the business, the idea that we're looking at is possibly franchising across the United States, but also to, as far as the competitors, you know, competitors are going to come up and want to do it. How do you, can you do the licensing? Like if somebody else wants to do that concept, you have franchise. But can yeah, you yeah, also yeah. do the license when somebody else wants to do the same concept but name the company something else? So I, I, I actually teach a, a class on uh, licensing. And I say in my class, franchising is a licensing on steroids. So a franchise agreement yeah. is really a license agreement. So now you're going to break it up under one brand name in franchise. Uh, it really, you, you would be best advised to um, make sure you have all of the proper franchise disclosures if you're also going to license a competitor to your franchisees. So I, I would be very careful there. Um, if your franchisees think they have exclusive rights to a territory, and now you're licensing that same concept, even if it's under another brand. Now, if it's properly disclosed, it may be OK, but I don't necessarily know um, if it's advisable to compete with yourself or something. So okay. I'd really focus in on you know, working with your attorneys and all the legalities. But the disclosures and franchising would be very important in that case. OK, thank you. Okay. I don't have much more to add to that. I, I, I put my sheet out on many of your desks and everything. If anybody doesn't have one, uh, please feel free to contact me. Afterwards, I have some extras for you. I see a woman in the front has a question. Yes, you, ma'am, with the. Oh, this. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Wait, we're going to get you a mic. Everyone needs to hear your question. Because we're also, yeah. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> OK. Uh, my question is, uh, this is for the licensing purpose. I'm debating, should I go design patent or a provisional patent? Which one is more? Um, because the design patent, you get well, patent faster. Okay. Uh, instead of just like a dragging for a provisional patent before you file a utility patent application. Okay, what is the, is the nature of the invention a design or is the nature of the invention, okay, does it do something? Both. Both, yeah, do something. I talked to a patent examiner, uh, he said I can go both design and utility. So I just want to confirm it. Um, okay. All right. The, 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 you can get you can obtain patents on those two things if the if the invention itself is, is composes a this particular design that would have value in and of itself apart from the functionality involved. Right. For example, the iPhone. They you know Steve Jobs got multiple design patents on on the con particular configuration of the iPhone. So. Uh, you can get a provisional patent on file for the functional aspects of your invention, as well as seek a design patent. So now, you probably will get the design patent fairly quickly. Right. That's All right? my question. So in that sense, it will, you know, it will give you some rights. But a design patent is very limited to the design only. And if somebody else has a different design, then you're, you're, you can't say, oh, they're infringing my patent, design patent. So you That's be the careful. key. You'll get the design patent quickly, but it won't have nearly the protection that you're looking for for your utility. Okay. My, my concern is uh, the pet, uh, design patent, you get the patent fast, faster. But it doesn't protect what you're lo it doesn't protect the utility if they do the exact oh. same purpose, but just configure it different so it looks different, you, you'll have a, a then competitor. Then pet, uh, patent is a pending. It's just the same situation. So that's why he said do both. Okay. Great. Yeah. There was one in the back now, or you guys got it. <laughs> and there, we, have, we know this side of the room is also They're being visited. neglected. Yeah. Hello. Hi. My name. Oh. oh. My, my name is Connie, and I'm from Maryland. And um, I have a new invention coming out, and I have um, a patent pending, provisional patent on it. But I don't want to do it. Okay, so is that a good product to be licensed? I, I, I don't have the ability to make the product. 
So we look, A, you, you need to go licensing because you're looking at your own personal resources, yeah. whether it's time, money, connections, et cetera. Licensing is a viable road for you. Is that a good product? I don't know the answer. Um, what I would say when I have to do, I, I mentioned this to, to somebody I spoke with earlier, when I look at an invention, we, we vet that three ways. One, is it a good idea? Will it sell? Two, we vet, okay, what's the patent stage? What's the likelihood of you getting the patent? And then three, is this an inventor that's going to be easy to work with that really wants a licensing deal? Or is this someone who's, who's you know, gonna be very difficult, A, for us, but more importantly, for the partner? Um, you know, you have to be willing to give up control and, and a lot of things when you do licensing. So if those three things check, then yeah, license. So Thank Steve, you. Can I follow up and ask you, um, do you need to, does she need to make a prototype? Like when you, when you <laughs> discuss with her, is it good to have, I ask, Donnie Deutsch, who's a TV guy, spoke at my school a million years ago and he said, one day in his office a big package arrived and he opened it up and it was like a plaster foot because somebody wanted the foot in their door. And he was like, this is interesting. So, so do, you, um, do you like to see a physical prototype or is it the 21st century we can do everything? You know, PDF, listen, uh, 3D graphics, uh, 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 some sort of you know, image or visual Dara talked about earlier today. You know, show me your product, but then don't tell me what you're showing me. Um, tell me about the benefits. So I've seen licensing deals everywhere from orally describing your concept to a drawing on a napkin, to actually being out there and selling the product. So, you know, that's not really the, the key factor of what stage it's at, because you could be anywhere along that, that continuum. And, and I, I'm thrilled, I'm really thrilled to be here because I used to literally be in your seat. I used to come to this conference, and I think it was Warren or one of the speakers last year that praised tear sheets. Yeah. And, and uh, we didn't talk, I didn't hear that, uh, this conference. What is a tear sheet and what, what value do they have? So uh, a tear sheet or, or mood boards. So uh, a tear sheet is really a one pager that describes the features and benefits of your product, has some sort of visual image, because again, mm -hmm. picture's worth a thousand words. So, you know, I, again, I had somebody at one of the breaks earlier today just show me a picture of her product on the iPhone. And I got it. I, I didn't need to ask a million questions. I saw the name, I saw what it does. Um, so, uh, but a tear sheet is a one pager now that gives me a little more information. So I'll have a picture, I'll see features, maybe I'll see costing analysis, maybe I'll see ingredients or, uh, you know, some of the elements of it. But the more information you can communicate briefly, I didn't want, somebody sent me a 26 page business plan when I asked for a, a tear sheet. And with all due respect, I'm not reading your 26 page business plan, but give me a one pager so I get the, the gist of what it, what it is. Let me follow up. Uh, uh, with this situation you have, it's going to be the situation of, of many of you. You have an idea. It, you, it has value, at least to you. So you want to protect this idea. So you file a provisional application. You try to seek licensing. Maybe you can't find it for a long time, maybe years. You have to convert it to a utility case. All right. If the invention has a significant enough value, you may also file what's called the PCT or the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which gives you the foreign option. All right? We live in a global environment. So a acquiring company that might be interested in your idea is, could be a global company, and they want to be sure that they have the global rights for this idea. So you might have to bite the bullet for a while and pay for the utility, pay for the PCT take it into the various countries perhaps even, but hopefully you're gonna find somebody, this is, this is a year's process, hopefully in that time period you're gonna find somebody that's willing to take up the burden of prosecution and paying all the attorneys and everything uh, that from there on. But if the idea has significant value, you, you gotta keep it alive. I mentioned before, keeping it alive, and this is one way to do that. Let's go back to the audience. How about this woman in the front? Tell us your name and where you're from, if you'd like. Because I think you've already spoken, so we kind of yeah. know you. Uh, I'm Corinne, and I'm from San Francisco. Uh, with licensing, you give up control, and I don't want to give up control. So do you have something else between? Well, is that true? Do you give up you control? Give, hold on. You give yeah. up some control. Yeah. 
there are performance standards and thresholds, but the reason you're going with the licensee is because you're going to go with the company that's an expert in this area. Somebody once said to me, you don't hire Bill Belichick and then tell him what plays to call. <laughs> the reason you hire him is because he's going to call the, the plays that you need. But I, I, want, I want the uh, object that I'm doing the way I want to do it because I'm servicing <laughs> society to help society and if it's different, it won't help. Well, that company may be more interested in making money exactly. than serving. So yeah. you got to just find the, find the right partner. Well, they could <laughs> hire her on as a technical yeah, expert absolutely. and things like that. It's a different contractual arrangement you'll make with them or wrap it into the one big arrangement. But you can, since you are the owner of your own idea, you can do whatever you want with that idea. And if, that, if you want to maintain control of that idea, if you can find somebody that's okay with that, all the better for you. Thank you. I know we have a lot of questions. Let's do some lightning rounds. Like, go ahead. Yeah. My name is Kamal Fernando from Ohio. If you want to know, I'm pushing next generation solar thermal energy for the, my country. So the question, I'm, I'm raising two scenarios. Explain to me the possibilities. Number one is your licensee does an improvement on your patent mm -hmm. and get a, another IP right for the person, for that party. Is that possible? Yeah, it's something that you definitely want in, especially something this high tech. You definitely yeah. want some of that in the license agreement, so it should be clear who owns those improvements. If they're spending the money and time developing it, do you automatically own it? Do they? And it's also sometimes hard to identify mm -hmm where exactly that idea came from. You say A, they say B, someone else says C, you wouldn't have gotten there without the, the prior steps. Um, but it, it, it needs to be in the license agreement. And you should see Ray after the, uh, after the thing, because that's a very specific question. So yeah. great so question. The, the question is, can, can that be in the contract? It, it, it should be in the contract. Yeah. Okay. One, one yeah. way so, or another, it should be yeah. in the contract. Second scenario is, uh, let's say I license my product to uh, my competitor, and then let's say the uh, agreement is that they will give me $100 for each uh, item they sell, but they do not sell anything. They just kill the product. Is that possible? Yeah. Well, of course. I mean, it, 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 you, but you want to have in the licensing arrangement certain thresholds and targets that they have to meet. And if they don't meet them, you have a penalty associated with it. Or you There's, can take it back. Or you could take it back. Guaranteed minimum yeah. royalties, performance thresholds, advances, all of those things to protect that. Uh, an experienced negotiator like Ray or myself would, would yeah. help you with that. Absolutely. How about we go back? Thank you. Um, I may have missed a point earlier or just need a little clarification. If you filed a provisional patent and then you've, in that your time period you've made some modifications uh, and you do expect and, and ultimately file a utility patent. There was mention of filing a second provisional first well, before the utility? Not necessarily. Uh, you, you can just, you can file a provisional and then you do further work on it. It depends on the importance of the additional thing. Let's say you've, you file a provisional and a month later you go, this is an important aspect. I forgot all about it. And it's important. You may find it valuable enough to file a second provisional. If it's not so valuable, it's just a little extra thing, you can wait to the year and then add all these other accumulated things into the, the final see, case. Okay. See us after class because yeah. prosecution <laughs> yeah. is very okay. complicated and we have some more questions. Thank you. you had one right, woman, woman right behind you, you. Cecile. Um, Ray, you had mentioned that if uh, you want the IP valuation, there's an option if you go on LES with a royalty for each industry, that's a potential option. When you're dealing with a new product, how would you advise an inventor to um, come up with their own IP valuation strategy before you actually present the idea to a licensee and see if there's a match? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's hard to answer that question mm -hmm. in the abstract um, without knowing what it is. But listen, negotiate the most you can get without outpricing yourself in the market. So, you know, always look at what your competing products are, are out there for because you got to stay competitive, especially if it's a consumer product on the store shelf. If you're, um, you know, 
blow dryer is six hundred dollars, but every other hair dryer is is twenty five to to seventy five dollars. You, you can't come out with a six hundred dollar one. So you have to look at where your competing products are, yeah. and and make sure that you don't uh, outprice yourself by building in too much royalties and guarantees. Right. I agree. A couple more behind you. Oh, sir. Hi, I'm Joe from DC. Uh, as an individual, I obtained a large p portfolio of patents, but now I, as I enter into licensing negotiations, how critical is it that I uh, go out and, and form my own company? And you know, what, uh, at what stage should I do that? I, I always like to have corporate entities in place. Yeah. Um, the, the separate and, and cover your liability. Uh, but again, you're going to require your licensees um, to have their own uh, insurances and indemnities. Um, I, I always like the extra layer of, of corporate protection, and you can assign the license and, and see myself or Ray after the session. You may even want to put each patent into a separate legal entity mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to really uh, pr protect against liability. One more over in the corner here. Thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so my question is this, um, if a fair royalty rate is based on percentage of wholesale uh, price, how do I determine this if my provisional patent is a small improvement on that company's existing product? <laughs> you know, it's interesting, and I have this issue. Um, and I could give an example. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's interesting because I have this issue. Um, we have a client that has a patent on a new kind of snapback, the, the back of a, of a baseball cap. And we're working with New Era and Top of the World, the top baseball cap companies. And we're trying to figure out, you know, exactly how to, we're trying to figure out exactly how to price this margin because he's not going to be able to charge much more for the baseball cap than they're already selling, even though they have this cool new, new back to it. So, um, it, again, it's all going to come down to dollars and cents. The inventor deposits money. He doesn't deposit percentages. And... Our most uh, important focus right now is how to price his royalty so that that cap on the store shelf isn't more money than the existing caps. Because I, people are, are going to want this new product, but they're not going to want to pay a lot more for yeah. it. So we're working backwards. But again, the goal is get the most you can without pricing yourself out. Yep. Thank you. I think time's up. I think that one. I just have back. one question for Stephen Heller. <laughs> I want to know how to build a brand in 30 seconds. <laughs> in 50 words or less. 30 seconds, that's all I want. That's it. Okay, go. So, again, building your brand, uh, whether you're uh, licensing DC your... Inventor. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, building your brand, whether you're licensing out your patent, whether you're branding yourself, because you're all inventors, your brand um, uh, is, is key important. But what you want to do, create something that differentiates yourself, be assertive, stand out in the marketplace, and evoke that emotion so that people like doing business with you and see opportunities to do business with you. So thank you. Okay.